This is the third plenary session of the April uh, 2013 APS meeting. And uh, we have three talks on frontier physics. Um, the first is Sam Zeller from Fermilab speaking on recent results and future opportunities in neutrino physics. Thank you, John. So I've decided to break up my talk into two uh, halves. One is to tell you what's new in neutrino physics. I'm going to focus mainly on results that have come out in the last year. And second, I'll talk about where we're headed next. So if someone comes up to you in a party and asks, what are neutrinos good for? Hopefully you'll be able to answer that question after hearing this talk. So first, let me remind you that neutrinos are everywhere. Together with photons, neutrinos are by far the most abundant particle in the universe. Large numbers of neutrinos were generated at the time of the Big Bang and are still whizzing around the universe. The sun is a prodigious source of neutrinos. Neutrinos shower down on us from Earth. A supernova, when it explodes, emits most of its energy in the form of neutrinos. And closer to home, neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactors that power our, our homes and businesses, and also by particle accelerators. And surprisingly so, even bananas are neutrino emitters through naturally occurring uh, potassium that radioactively decays in bananas. That's in fact how we discovered neutrinos in the first place, not through bananas, but through beta decay. It turns out that because neutrinos are so abundant, they may be associated with some rather profound questions about how our universe works. In addition to being very abundant, neutrinos are also uh, quite special. For the main reason that there are many sources of neutrinos. Here shows a plot of the various sources of neutrinos as a function of their energy. It turns out we've detected almost all of these neutrino sources starting from the very lowest energy neutrinos from the Earth's crust and mantle, all the way up to the recent detection of the very highest energy neutrinos from the Ice Cube experiment. These are PETA-EV uh, neutrinos, 10 to the 15 electron volt neutrinos. They're presenting a new mystery. Ice Cube saw two of these such events. We don't know what their source is, but they look certainly not to be atmospheric, and they're under study currently. So because we have this large range of neutrino sources that span a wide range of energies, neutrinos, in fact, turn out to have a lot to say. We've gotten a lot of information this way because neutrinos have allowed us to study physical phenomena across vastly different energy scales. It's, in fact, hard to find another particle with the same dynamic range as the neutrino. So we've used many of these sources to make major discoveries in the field. So neutrinos are abundant. We talked about how they're special, and they're also full of surprises. It turns out that one of our biggest discoveries in neutrino physics came from two rather unexpected sources, solar neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos. It's from these two sources that we discovered that neutrinos can change from one type to another. They can transform from one type of neutrino to another type of neutrino through a phenomenon known as neutrino oscillations. This phenomenon was first detected uh, in solar neutrinos in the 1970s, and they puzzled scientists for over 30 years. Corroborating evidence was later uh, detected in atmospheric neutrinos, which, which proved that neutrinos were in fact oscillating from one type to another. Those oscillations depend on the length, the distance the neutrino has traveled, and on their energy. So it's quite remarkable, if you think about it, that the, that the distances the neutrinos were traveling and their energies were just right from the sun and from the atmosphere that we were able to detect this quite incredible phenomenon. And it's important because it represented the first significant alteration to our standard model of particle physics. The super-K results that uh, landed atmos uh, the atmospheric neutrino oscillations on solid footing remains to this day one of the most cited papers in experimental high-energy physics with over 4,000 citations. And when these results first came out, they made the front page of the New York Times. I was in grad school at the time and, and decided at that point that I really wanted to, uh, to explore this phenomenon in more detail. So we know from the existence of neutrino oscillations that neutrinos are definitely massive and they have extremely small masses. These experiments have identified two very different mass scales. Here are the three neutrino masses. We know that there's a mass splitting that has to do with the solar oscillations. That's a very small mass difference. And we know there's a second splitting having to do with the atmospheric neutrinos. So while these first indications of neutrino transformations were seen in astrophysical sources, so-called wild neutrinos, We've also carefully tested this phenomenon in, in carefully controlled experiments using both particle accelerators and nuclear reactors. And these plots on the left show two such examples of this. On the top is a plot from the MINOS experiment, which tested the atmospheric neutrino oscillations using an accelerator-produced beam of neutrinos, which shows the deficit of neutrinos absorbed from that source as a function of the neutrino's energy. 
Likewise, the Kamlin experiment tested the solar neutrino oscillations using a nuclear reactor. And here you see quite a nice te textbook example of neutrino oscillations, where this is plotted the survival probability of the neutrinos from the reactor as a function of their distance divided by the neutrino's energy. You can see they measure a certain number of reactor neutrinos, and then those neutrinos disappear and then reappear in this beautiful oscillatory pattern. These experiments have since confirmed very solidly that neutrinos transform from one type to another. And across four continents, experiments all uh, sought to, to establish this phenomenon, and now it is firmly established. So in addition to the two mass splittings I just mentioned, neutrino oscillations are also characterized by some mixing angles. You can write out the mixing in, in this form, where you can separate out the mixing into three uh, rotations, one having to do with the atmospheric oscillations on the left, and one on the right having to do with the solar oscillations. This matrix in the middle has to do with uh, the smallest of the neutrino mixings, what we call theta-1-3. You'll see that notation consistently throughout the talk, so I'll introduce that as the smallest mixing. It's much smaller mixing than, say, the atmospheric or the solar sectors. And it gets multiplied here by a term that depends on a phase called delta CP that governs the possibility for neutrinos to violate uh, CP. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in order to detect these CP violating effects, in fact, all three of the mixing angles need to be non-zero, and this theta-1-3 angle also needs to be non-zero. If you collect all that we know about neutrino oscillations and multiply out this matrix, you get this mi mixing matrix for the neutrinos. I should mention that quarks also mix from one state to another, and this is, the, in contrast, the quark mixing matrix. You can see this matrix is mostly unitary, with small off-diagonal elements representing the small mixing among quarks. In contrast, the neutrino mixing has all large elements. The neutrino mixing is actually quite large. But what we observe from this is the neutrino mixing pattern is completely different compared to the quark sector. We don't know if this picture is correct or not. We don't know if this mixing matrix and the two mass splittings are the correct interpretation. But we want to test this, and we want to push on this to see if this picture fails. So this is what future efforts will be involved with. So we've already determined that neutrinos oscillate but we don't know the rest of the story. And there are, in fact, some big questions that we face moving forward. And what's quite remarkable is that 15 years ago, we didn't even know we could ask these questions. But in fact, this observation of this subtle neutrino oscillation effect has presented this list of very important questions having to deal with neutrinos. The first question we don't know the answer to is, what's the absolute masses of the neutrinos? Oscillations tell us their mass differences, but we don't know what their absolute masses are. This seems to be quite an embarrassing question. We don't know the masses of these very fundamental subatomic particles. We don't know why they're so light. Uh, we don't know what that light mass means. And we don't know what it means for the evolution of the universe. We also don't know whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles. This has to do with whether or not neutrinos are their own antiparticles. The answer to that question may, in fact, tell us why neutrino masses are so small. We also don't know what are the underlying symmetries that generate this pattern of neutrino mixing. What, what's behind this whole story? Want to know if there's more to this story? Is it possible that neutrinos interact also in some non-standard way? Is it possible that there's more than three generations of neutrinos, perhaps a sterile neutrino? We'll talk more about that later. We also don't know what the ordering of the masses is. We don't know which is the lightest. We don't know which is the heaviest. We don't know how they're arranged. This shows, for example, the two possible hierarchies of neutrino masses. On the left is what's called the normal hierarchy. This is if the neutrino masses are arranged in the same hierarchy that governs, say, the charged leptons and the quarks, which is what uh, would be expected from grand unified theories. On the right is if you flip this on its head, and this is so-called the inverted hierarchy, if neutrinos, in fact, their masses are oriented in this way, it would be really weird. And we'd like to know which of the masses are the smallest and which is the heaviest. And finally, we'd also like to know whether or not CP is violated in the neutrino sector. CP has to do with the uh, combined symmetry of both charge and parity. What it means is if you were to repeat your neutrino experiment using antineutrinos rather than neutrinos and view the experiment in a mirror, that you'd get out different results. This is important because we think if neutrinos and antineutrinos behave differently, if they oscillate differently, then it may in fact be tied to why the universe preferentially selected matter over antimatter. This is the ultimate quest, the discovery of this next century for neutrino oscillations experiments to really try and pinpoint whether or not neutrinos are telling us why we exist. So this is where we're headed. These are the questions we're trying to answer. Some of them are quite simple, having to do with what are the masses, how are they arranged, what's behind this whole story. 
But unfortunately, there's no single experiment that can answer all of these questions. So we have to rely again on our copious sources of neutrinos to tell us what's going on. The questions at the top can be answered by beta decay experiments and double beta decay experiments. These are non-oscillation experiments. We'll talk about those towards the end of my presentation. And these remaining questions here, the bulk of those can be um, determined and answered with neutrino oscillation experiments. It turns out that this last question, which has really been the holy grail for neutrino physics, uh, can only be answered if, in fact, the small mix angle we talked about two slides ago is non-zero. Otherwise, that CP phase cannot be accessed, and you cannot determine whether or not neutrinos violate CP vi violation. So we've really been on a quest to pin down this smallest kind of neutrino oscillation. As I explained before, we know this mixing, theta-1,3, is much smaller than the atmospheric and solar mixing that we observe. And we've really wanted to know, what is this last mixing angle? Is it non-zero? Uh, is it has, does it have a small value? I've had many kids, this is my niece, asking me incessantly if I know theta-1,3 yet. She calls me all the time. Our big concern was that theta-1,3 would be too small to measure. Our entire future hinged upon this measurement. So we waited with bated breath. We planned a bunch of experiments to go after this last mixing angle. And the measurement of this mixing angle is one of the key developments in the past year in neutrino physics, also known as uh, theta reactor. It's known as theta reactor because of the fact that we've been able to measure this smallest of neutrino mixings using reactor experiments. And reactor experiments can measure this angle without having to know the other neutrino mixing parameters. So it's a very clean measurement. The only ingredients you need are a very powerful reactor. They're a very powerful source of neutrinos, actually anti-electron neutrinos. And you need multiple detectors, both the near site and the far site, to help minimize systematics in your experiment. So what you do is you look for these reactor neutrinos to have disappeared over a short distance. This shows the survival probability of those neutrinos as a function of the distance they've traveled. Out here is the large solar oscillations we talked about before. And the CAMLAN results, that was that textbook example that confirmed solar oscillations using a reactor source of neutrinos. But if you move your experiments closer to the reactor, say at a kilometer, you could detect this very small mixing associated with theta-1,3. So you're looking for now a very small deficit of reactor neutrinos very close to the reactor source, about a kilometer from the reactor source. So we're looking for a pretty subtle effect, and we save the best for last. So there's three experiments that set out to look for this effect. Dia Bay experiment in China, the Reno reactor experiment in Korea, and the double show experiment in France. <clears throat> it turned out after turning on, they, they uh, used multiple reactors and multiple detectors to make their measurements. <clears throat> and after collecting several hundreds of thousands of reactor antineutrinos over the first several months of running, they were able to see clear evidence for a deficit in their data. This was very exciting. Since that time, the experiments have updated their results. This is to show their updates. This is from Dia Bay. They since collected 139 days of data, and this is what they observe in their experiment. This is the observation of reactor antineutrinos seen at their source. The solid curve is what they predict based on measurements from the very near detector, which measures the a reactor flux. And the black points are what they observe at the far detector. And you can see this deficit of antineutrinos that they observe at their reactor that's consistent with a non-zero value of this small mixing angle. So this was rather successful in that we could predict what we'd expect to see based on the picture we formulated before. We just didn't know the amplitude of the effect. This is this red curve plotting the survival probability as a function of the distance from the reactor. Here's the measurements from the near detectors. And here's the measurements from the far detector with a clear deficit. 5% of the reactor neutrinos were missing. And based on that uh, picture, they could set a value for the small mixing angle measured here. It's an eight sigma signal for a non-zero value for this small mixing. So what's nice is that our picture was able to make a prediction that we could then test and measure in our experiments. And in fact, the Dia Bay result is the, now the most precise measurement of this mixing angle, and that will persist for the foreseeable future. The Reno and Double Show reactors also came out recently with updated results seeing similar effects. Uh, deficits of reactor neutrinos, both from this uh, Korean reactor source and from the source in France. We're here in this case, double show also fit the shape of that spectrum in addition to looking for the overall deficit. What's nice is that we now know this last remaining mixing angle, and this shows the evolution of measurements of that mixing angle in history. Here's zero. You can see as time went on, the results start to pull away from zero. Those results have been dominated by the reactor results after those experiments turned on in 2011. 
And so in a few short months, we went from knowing essentially very little about this small mixing angle to it being the most well-measured of the mixing angles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've since now excluded this angle being zero at greater than seven se sigma significance. So you might ask, what does this all mean? It turns out that the fact that this small mixing has a non-zero value has profound impact on neutrino physics. It's opened the door to learning much more about neutrinos and their habits. The fact that all three mixing angles are non-zero means that we can now look for subtle differences between neutrino and anti-neutrino oscillations that will hopefully tell us why we live in a world that's dominated by matter. What upset this balance between matter and antimatter? It means that such a measurement of CP violation in the neutrino sector is now within our grasp. This knowledge of theta-13 was needed to plan our next steps. It means a very bright future awaits us. In addition, it, the fact that we've measured this angle has also helped us to narrow down our model choices quite significantly. This plot shows a host of different, different uh, model predictions for what the neutrino mix angle should be. Uh, since about 2006, there's about 63 different models. And the yellow band shows uh, what the measurement from the Diabay reactor experiment is shows that it excludes many of the models that made solid predictions for what this theta-13 mixing should be. So far, we've not really had a good guess at what the theory is underlying this mixing. The compass wheel has kind of been spinning around. So if it turns out that one of these models is right, then we've made big progress, and it's a really big deal. And you can see already how some of this data is already starting to heavily constrain our thinking and our theoretical models. So I talked a lot about reactor neutrinos. What about accelerator-based neutrinos? There's also been a full court press on neutrino oscillations using accelerator-based neutrino sources. Just to remind you from our short baseline reactor neutrinos, we were able to look for the disappearance of reactor neutrinos to give us a nice clean measurement of this small mixing angle. The situation is a little different for accelerator-based neutrinos. Here, instead of looking for disappearance, you look for the appearance of electron neutrinos. That appearance is sensitive to a combination of the atmospheric mixing as well as this small mixing. Also, since you're sending your neutrinos across long distances, hence long baseline, you're also sensitive to matter effects, which has to do with the ordering of the neutrino masses, as well as being sensitive to CP violation. So this reactor approach is, sorry, this accelerator-based approach is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse in that it's sensitive to all these different effects, so it can be complicated to extract this information from your data. But it's also a blessing in the fact that you can use this data to really tell you uh, the answers to these very basic questions. Also, using a very well-prepared source of neutrinos from an accelerator, you can not only look for the appearance of electron neutrinos in that beam, but also simultaneously for the disappearance of the muon neutrinos that you've created. You can also create both neutrinos and anti-neutrinos in your source to look for differences between the way those two oscillate. Again, that would be a definitive uh, confirmation of CP violation. And what's nice about accelerator neutrinos, you also have control over your source. You can turn the accelerator on and off if you want to. Uh, and you can also aim the neutrinos at a specific uh, direction to a specific detector. So let me tell you what's been going on in accelerator neutrinos since we've just reviewed the situation with reactor neutrinos. There's two experiments that have been pumping out results uh, in the past several years. One from Minos, which sends its neutrinos from Fermilab to Minnesota. It's a 735 kilometer distance. They've been running since 2005 and are wrapping up their final measurements. T2K just started running in 2010. They send their neutrinos from the east coast of Japan to the west coast of Japan, a distance of 295 kilometers, uh, reusing the Super Kamiokande detector. This is the detector that produced those stunning uh, results on atmospheric neutrino oscillations back in the 1990s. T2K is a next generation experiment using the same detector, but running off axis. These experiments look both for the disappearance of muon neutrinos produced in their accelerators and also the appearance of a new kind of neutrino, the electron neutrino. So they do both a simultaneous disappearance and appearance measurements. This shows what the experiments see for disappearance. This is an example from MENA showing a really nice plot of how this all works together. So the combination of all the data they've collected in the last year, uh, eight years, showing both neutrinos and antineutrinos from the accelerator as well as neutrinos that they collect from atmospheric uh, neutrino sources as a function of the energy of the neutrinos. And black is what you'd expect if there were no neutrino oscillations, and is, red is the best fit uh, to a, a model with neutrino oscillations. So unlike quark mixing, you see large effects in the neutrino sector, and you see some very obvious spectral distortions in the data. 
Likewise, TDK has been taking data rather smoothly after recovering from the earthquake and tsunami that devastated Japan in March 2011. This shows results that they just came out with in February after that miraculous recovery, and they're running really well now. Here shows in blue the prediction they get for the number of neutrinos they should see at the far site if there were no oscillations as a function of the energy of those neutrinos, and the points are what they actually observe. So on their energy and their distances, they're seeing almost a complete disappearance of muon neutrinos. Again, a very dramatic and stark effect. Using those two observations and applying the picture we've built up, you can then set constraints on the atmospheric mixing. This shows the mass difference that's established by the atmospheric neutrinos and their mixing. Minos here in black provides the most precise measurements of the mass splitting. And T2K recently in February reported the most precise measurement of the atmospheric mixing angle. So together, these two experiments are providing the best constraints on atmospheric neutrino mixing. However, there's some slight tension between the two results. Minos is starting to prefer slightly less than maximal mixing. Um, it's not a huge effect, but something that's kind of interesting is that pole is being driven largely by the atmospheric data they have in their data sample. What's, inter what's most interesting is this question of whether or not this atmospheric mixing is truly maximal. If it's maxil maximal, it can point to some hidden symmetry. There are models that predict that it should pull slightly away from maximal, just like theta-1,3 was just slightly not zero. So a precise measurement of this mixing can help constrain those models. And also, it's very crucial to improve our measurement of this mixing because it appears, as I mentioned before, in combination with theta-1,3 in the long baseline neutrino oscillation probabilities. So our ability to detect uh, CP violation hinges upon our uncertainties in measuring this atmospheric mixing more precisely. And these experiments will continue to collect more data and hone on that more precisely. Now, I mentioned that the muon neutrinos were disappearing. It's one thing to observe the disappearance. You might also ask, well, what are they changing into? Most of the time, we know that they are changing into tau neutrinos. So it'd be nice to actually detect the tau neutrinos. Tau neutrinos are notoriously difficult to detect, but there's a very special detector in Europe trying to do just that, a detector called OPERA. It's using about 200,000 bricks uh, that are containing a special substance called emulsion that is much like photographic film. And these are two uh, event displays from the OPERA detector showing the uh, clear detection of a tau lepton from a tau neutrino interaction in their detector. So you see this uh, small kinked track coming from the tau decay in the emulsion. Just a few weeks ago, they reported the observation of a third tau neutrino. They had previously seen two such events coming from the CERN to Gran Sasso beam, where the detector is located. They plan to take another two years of data that will help complete this puzzle as we collect this clear observation of new tau neutrinos coming from muon neutrino oscillations. In addition, the muon neutrinos have another channel they can take. They can also oscillate into electron neutrinos. That oscillation is governed by the same small mixing that governs the disappearance of reactor neutrinos that we saw previously. So this probability is very, very small, but we're able to see it. This shows an example appearance of electron neutrinos in both the MINOS and T2K experiments as a function of the energy of those neutrinos in the case of MINOS, as a function of the angle and momentum of the electrons produced in those events in T2K. So this is what they see. Um, these are challenging experiments, but neutrino physicists are used to doing difficult things, and we're good at being patient. So in this case, we're looking for small signals. T2K has seen 11 events, MINOS just over 120 events. Based on those observations of the appearance of electron neutrinos, they're again able to put our neutrino oscillation picture into play and set uh, measurements of the theta-1,3 mixing angle, the reactor mixing angle. Here they see poles of that angle from zero, again, quite consistent with what we see from the reactor data. It's been very um, powerful to compare the accelerator-based measurements to those previous reactor measurements. But as, you'll see, as you can see from the accelerator measurements, we do not have unique solutions of theta-1,3. These results, as I mentioned before, depend on what the CP violating phase is, which is why these uh, uh, measurements are plotted as a function of delta CP. They also depend on what the mass ordering is, which is why there's two panels in each of these plots. And they also depend on the atmospheric mixing. So what can we hope to learn from such data? These searches for electron neutrino appearance in these accelerator-based experiments across long distances have, have, as I mentioned, have sensitivity to the combination of the atmospheric mixing the mass ordering, and CP violation. But if theta-1,3, the reactor angle had been, had been zero, none of this would have been possible, and you would not have seen any signals. The fact that we're sensitive to all these effects is the concept behind future accelerator-based long baseline neutrino experiments. 
So Minos has attempted a first analysis of how such um, an analysis would proceed using this data to probe all of these combined effects. So this plot shows as a function of the yet unknown uh, CP violating phase delta, what the whole data uh, uh, constraints for various combinations of effects for different orderings of the neutrino masses and different values for the atmospheric mixing uh, curves above these two horizontal lines exclude those choices either 68 percent confidence level or 90 percent confidence level. So you can see while using the collection of MINOS data which is both appearance and disappearance data from both the accelerator and the atmospheric events they collect we cannot yet set any, say anything really strongly about which world we prefer for neutrino scattering physics However, it's a proof in principle to show how this data could become very useful in the future. And that future is now. We're already starting to build the predecessor, ex successor experiment to MINOS. The experiment's called NOVA, which stands for NUMI Off-Axis Neutrino Experiment. It's a next generation, long baseline, accelerator-based experiment that will be fully operational in 2014. It will study these rare muon neutrino to electron neutrino transitions over even longer distances now. 810 kilometers sending neutrinos from a very intense source of neutrinos from Fermilab to uh, uh, northern Minnesota. This is the closest you can get to the U.S.-Canada border, so the, the longest distance we can possibly send neutrinos in this direction. They're using a, a narrow band off-axis beam and what will be soon the world's most intense accelerator-based source of neutrinos. And this is a simulation of what an electron neutrino might look like in that detector. The detector is quite massive. It's, it's a really cool detector. Because the neutrino cross-sections are so small, it's the weak interaction after all, and these electron signals are so small, you need a massive detector to be able to make great progress in the field. This shows an example of what the NOVA fully uh, constructed far detector will look like. It's 15 meters by 15 meters on a side. It's constructed of extruded plastic scintillator, uh, plastic uh, tubing that's filled with liquid scintillator and read out by wave-like shifting fibers. Um, in, in the end, when it's entirely filled, it will be filled with over 14,000 tons of liquid scintillator. Once constructed, it will be the largest uh, self-supporting plastic structure ever built. And this shows for comparison, an Airbus A380 could park itself inside the detector. Uh, they'll have not only the far detector, but also a smaller near detector to measure the neutrinos before they set off on their journey to northern Minnesota. This shows the status of the NOVA detector. Uh, in yellow is the number of planes they have yet to install. In, in red is the planes they have installed. They have about five and a half kilotons of detector installed so far. Two and a half kilotons are filled, and over 7,000 channels are instrumented. That's a little part in green. They've also completely excavated their near detector cavern, so it's ready to start installing the near detector. They've been in steady state production mode now for the last several months, and they fill about a half a kiloton of the detector every two weeks. Based on this tiny portion of the detector they've already instrumented, they've been able to detect cosmic rays in the detector. This is an example of a cosmic ray that was detected in this tiny part of NOVA that's instrumented on March 28th. They, this uh, small segment of instrumented detector catches about a thousand cosmic rays every second. This is the picture I got from one of the students doing the analysis. If you ask the spokespeople for a picture of that same event, you get this fancy one. This is a 3D image of that same cosmic ray muon producing a large shower in the first completed section of the NOVA detector. So based on this stunning event, I can't wait to see what neutrino events will look like in this really stunning detector. It will be truly remarkable. So what are the prospects of taking neutrino data with this miraculous detector? They will start taking neutrino beam in June with a partially instrumented far detector as they work to build up the rest of the detector modules. This shows how they expect that running to go as a function of time in terms of the significance of the electron neutrino signal that it would observe in that detector. In the first year of running alone, they expect to get to about a five sigma um, measurement of that electron neutrino appearance. It depends on what the mass ordering is, however. And then once they uh, collect uh, some number of neutrino events, they'll switch to antineutrino mode and steadily take antineutrino events. And using that data, they can have a playlist. They can make precise measurements of the atmospheric mixing, which remember we said is very important to our CP violation pursuits. They can also make very precise measurements of the reactor mixing, theta 1, 3. They can also measure the neutrino mass ordering because we're sending neutrinos across these very large distances from Fermilab to northern Minnesota. And if we're really, really lucky, we may even see a hint of CP violation if nature is kind to us. And powerful combinations of this NOVA data will be possible also with continued running of T2K to really hone in on the oscillation phase space. I'll skip over MINOS+. Plus. The MINOS detector will run in the same beam looking for 
um, things beyond neutrino oscillations, looking for anything funky in the data, and they will start running also in June. So I mentioned that we have the reactor experiments taking data in, in China, Korea, and France. The TDK experiment, uh, the first off-axis long baseline experiment in Japan taking data, and in Europe, OPERA, and also a companion detector, Icarus, which is a liquid argon detector, will be uh, pumping out a continuous uh, set of physics results across the next uh, few years. NOVA will be turning on next year, as I mentioned, sending its beam to northern Minnesota. MINOS will continue running in that, in that beam as long as we're already producing the beam for NOVA. And we've started to ask questions about what do we want to do next? So with the support of the U.S. Department of Energy and also along with about 350 of my colleagues, we've started to plan this next step. And the idea is to send neutrinos across an even longer distance, now 1,300 kilometers or, 1800, or 1,300 kilometers or 800 miles from Fermilab to uh, a site in South Dakota using a proposed experiment called LBNE, which stands for perhaps uncreatively long baseline neutrino experiment with the main goal is to definitively detect CP violation in neutrino scattering. So all eyes now are on CP violation and we're trying to plan those next steps, which have been enabled by the fact that this small mixed angle theta 1, 3 is non-zero. So we need several ingredients for such a future experiment. First, we need a baseline, a neutrino baseline that's optimized to be able to detect CP violation and not get confused by matter effects having to do with the mass ordering. So we think that 1,300 kilometers is that optimal distance. We've also designed a new broadband beam, unlike T2K and NOVA, which used a narrow beam. Now we're designing a very broadband neutrino beam. That's particularly important because we want to be able to measure the spectrum of neutrinos across the largest dynamic range possible. We want to be sure we're detecting a CP violating effect and not get confused by our own data. So we want to really be able to, in detail, exquisitely me uh, measure these spectral distortions. In addition, we've also uh, chosen as our far detector a liquid argon time projection chamber. These are really stunning, exquisite detectors that have very low backgrounds and maintain high efficiency over a broad energy range that are well suited for such a broadband beam. So we think we have the best baseline, the best beam, and the best far detector as essential ingredients. This is the menu of our science goals for this long baseline neutrino experiment that we hope will start running, say, in the year 2020. It will be a comprehensive program to measure neutrino oscillations with the main goal being to discover and characterize CP violation in the neutrino sector. In addition, we hope with this, with this very nice data to be able to resolve other missing pieces of the neutrino puzzle, including resolving the mass ordering if it's not uh, figured out by that time yet precisely measure the neutrino oscillation parameters uh, beyond where current experiments will be able to achieve, and as well searching for new physics, anything beyond this picture that we haven't thought of yet. By having a massive underground detector, our hope is to have this detector underground in the Homestake mine in South Dakota. It also will enable other very important fundamental physics, including searches for proton decay at the gut scale. Uh, we can detect supernova burst neutrinos. I've been told we're due for a supernova, so it'd be really stunning to detect that in such a detector. We'd be sensitive to neutrinos and not anti-neutrinos, which has been observed previously by supernova 1987A. As well, we can have very nice samples of atmospheric neutrinos all in the same detector. This shows what the signals might look like in such a detector, in such a device. Uh, this shows what the neutrino appearance would look like on the left panel and what the appearance of uh, anti-neutrinos would look like, both as a function of the neutrino energies. There's two cases we have to consider, whether or not the mass arrangement is normal or if it's inverted. So you can see the signals are different for neutrinos and anti-neutrinos depending on whether that mass arrangement is normal or inverted. We can see large signals, again, because we have a very intense beam in this case and a very large detector. This is for a 35 kiloton liquid argon detector. Here's some examples of what these signals would look like. You can observe the spectral distortions in the events, these different curves show what uh, different choices of the CP violation phase would do. You can see large signals depending on whether you turn that CP violation on or off. We'd also like to observe differences directly between the neutrinos and the antineutrinos to give us direct evidence that we've in fact detected a CP violating effect. So with this beautiful data, we hope to get at these very key questions in neutrino physics. Here's the long range plan for this experiment shows the sensitivity we have to CP violation as a function of exposure, which is a combination of time and the size of the far detector. So we hope to start off with a NOVA type beam, ramp up to a one megawatt beam, and then a fully capable two megawatt beam, which gets us at a five sigma determination of CP violation with that device. 
This shows how well we'll be able to measure the delta CP phase angle with these uh, three different steps. Again, getting down to the level of which we've been able to probe pork mixing uh, previously. This first phase of the experiment was granted uh, the first step of a Department of Energy approval in December 2012, which is quite exciting. It includes the key elements of the experiment, which is the beam, uh, the liquid argon detector, and the baseline. And once that experiment is built, the long-range plan includes increasing the fire detector in increments, making it larger and larger, and also, as I showed here, increasing the beam intensity all the way up to 2 megawatts. Again, you need large detectors and, and lots of neutrinos to be able to detect these subtle effects. Now, I mentioned the detector we want to use. It's called a liquid argon time projection chamber. This shows an example of what a neutrino event looks like in such a detector. The blue is the liquid argon. There's a neutrino coming in from the left. Here it interacts in the argon. And this shows the spray of particles that come out. This is an actual event in the detector. So you can see millimeter scale resolution. These are really beautiful detectors. However, we've never built these detectors on the size and scale that we need for our long baseline neutrino physics program. So we want to start out small to gain some experience. So we're starting with the microboom detector, which is a jointly funded Department of Energy and NSF project, which is to build a 170 ton liquid argon um, time projection chamber. It's about 200 the size, 200 times smaller than the type of detector we need for the long baseline neutrino experiment. We want to start out small to gain some experience. The detector is about the size of a school bus. Here shows the TPC. It's a, it's a metal frame that will be housed inside the cryostat, which will be filled with liquid argon and cryogenically cooled. Our hope is that we'll be ready to take neutrino beam with this device in 2014. Our students are, are, we have an excellent team of students and postdocs that are very busy putting this detector together and helping us commission it. Um, we had, we've moved one step closer to reality recently and had the cryostat was delivered a few weeks ago to Fermilab and we've already done a test fit of the TPC into that cryostat a few weeks prior. So this is a very important R&D step towards realizing these very nice liquid argon detectors for the future long baseline neutrino physics program. And also we want to get some really nice physics out of this in the meantime. So let me skip neutrino cross-sections. I wanted to say a few brief words about how the importance of neutrino interactions are to all this physics. Our ability to detect subtle effects like CP violation and the mass arrangement critically relies on us knowing how neutrinos interact normally with matter. So there's been... Uh, a number of new results on neutrino interactions coming from a variety of experiments, including some very new recent results shown by Minerva at this conference, which has been very exciting. It's shown how we've already been able to discriminate between various different model choices using this data. We also want to look to see whether there's more than three neutrinos. This has been a very hot topic late lately, and a lot of people thinking about this. There's a very nice paper, if you want to read more, about the current status of looking for more than three neutrinos and how we might address that question. And finally, before I conclude, we also want to know about the neutrino masses themselves. Neutrino masses are, are quite weird. If you look at the neutrino masses compared to the other uh, subatomic particle masses, there's about six orders of magnitude separating the neutrino masses from those particles. We don't know why that is. We also don't know the absolute neutrino masses. We only know ranges for those masses. So there's some experiments coming on looking at beta decay, which will pin down those neutrino masses. And we're hoping that if neutrinos are, in fact, Majorana, it may give us a clue as to why these neutrino masses are so much smaller than the other particles. The way to detect whether or not neutrinos are Majorana and whether this is a clue to why the neutrino masses are so small stems from looking for neutrinoless double beta decay. These are certain experiments that look for this very rare process that only occurs if neutrinos are Majorana. And if the mass hierarchy is inverted, then the next generation experiments have a really good shot at answering this question of whether or not neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac. And that would, is a really big, uh, crucial question in our field and would be a major discovery. So to conclude, neutrino physics continues to be an incredibly exciting field. There's some very extreme, uh, important neutrino experiments in the next decade and beyond that are working to answer some very big questions in neutrino physics. Namely, what are the neutrino masses and why are they so small? Are neutrinos Majorana particles and is that giving us a clue to why the neutrino masses are so light? What is the ordering of the neutrino masses? Which is the lightest? Which is the heaviest? And ultimately, do neutrinos violate CP? And could that be a clue as to why we exist? We'll use a variety of neutrino sources to answer these questions using beta decay, cosmic neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, and accelerator neutrinos, which together will, will form a very, very strong program moving forward. As I mentioned, the discovery of this last, last mixing angle has, has really made the long baseline neutrino path very clear and enabled us a guaranteed measurement of CP violation if we designed the right experiment. 
So nature gave us all of these neutrino sources and gave us the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. We now know what it, we now want to know what it all means. So thank you and come join us. In view of the time, I think we have time for one question. Please uh, approach a, a microphone uh, so that everybody can hear. Okay, you have to get to a microphone. I can barely see you, Hamish. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Uh, Nova seems to be making really good progress. I was wondering if you could tell us when it will determine the, the hierarchy and, and what the uh, precision of that determination would be. Sure. So I have that in a backup plot if you'd like to see. Um, so NOVA plans to run for six years, so roughly three years in neutrino running and three years in anti-neutrino running. So this shows the significance with which NOVA will be able to determine the mass hierarchy uh, if we live in a normal hierarchy world in blue and an inverted hierarchy world in red. This is the significance on this side going from zero to three sigma. On the right shows the combination you'd get if you also combine the data from T to K. And you can see if you live in the unfavorable side of what the delta CP phase could be, and you're unlucky, if you combine, however, with the T to K data, that helps boost the sensitivity of this joint experiments to the mass hierarchy. So if the, for example, if the n mass hierarchy is normal and you're in this unlucky area of what the delta CP phase is, you're at best a one sigma determination of the mass hierarchy. But if you're in the favorable region, you're up over at the three sigma level. So again, the point is you'll be able to determine the mass ordering depending on whether nature is, in kind, is kind to us or not. And again, the combination of NOVA and TDK is very important because they have different baselines, and that can help resolve degeneracies, pitting the two together. Okay. Thank you very much.